Okay, we're recording now. Oh. Right, right, we'll just start now then. Um, welcome everyone to another CAS webinar. So just a reminder that we have our belated AGM on the 29th of September. And Robert will no doubt be preparing the agenda for this and either he or I We'll attach it to an email and send it to everyone beforehand so that you can print it out. Uh, I have booked webinars and speakers right up to the 14th of December. As I said last time, we decided to keep these going till the end of the year to keep everyone safe. Our next speaker will be on the 5th of October when we have Pete Williamson. Remote Telescopes for Public and Educational Access. Um, right, so tonight we have Eddie Carpenter with an anniversary talk. This is going to be two, three minutes. Then our main speaker, Roy Bryce, The Geology of Venus. So let's give Eddie a warm Kaz welcome. Thank you. Right, uh, September the 1st. 1974. No, any luck? Anyone? No, it was Mariner 10. Does anyone remember Mariner 10? Yep. It, yes. it, it, it gave us our first close up views of the planet. Mars? Not Mars, not Mars no, no, Venus. Mer Mercury, Mercury. Oh, Mercury, right. The, the first view we had showed virtually nothing, but. The second view with Mariner 10 was a close, well, much closer flyby and revealed what it looked like the moon, basically. Um, so that was the anniversary. Um, this, this day in 1974, Mariner 10 did a flyby of Mercury. For, for my Cornish astronomer, I expect you've heard of Sir Humphrey Davy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He was basically not an astronomer, but he was a chemist. He was interested in uh, elements, particularly elements on the sun. He got some of this information from his younger brother, John Davy. That's the that's an astronomer I'm going to talk about. John Davy, uh, 19, 1790 to 1868. Uh, he did most of his observations. In fact, John, well, you know, Humphrey Davy was born in Penzance went to the grammar school that I went to. And obviously his brother, John Davy, was also born in Penzance. And they worked together for a while doing some astronomy, but mainly chemistry. John, John was mainly interested in his work, in his brother's work on elements. And eventually uh, Humphrey Davy invented the Davy safety, sa lamp. safety lamp. Safety lamp I, for the miners. The minor safety lamp, because there was a lot of mining going on in Cornwall and a lot, lot, a lot of deaths. So he invented the minor safety lamp, which worked actually about 90% of the time. It's still a risky thing to use. But then his brother actually carried on doing some chemical work to help, his, uh, to help hum Humphrey. But he's more interested in astronomy and uh, he became a medical doctor. And did most of astronomy actually with a bit of sen in the, at a sensible place. He went to the West Indies to do his observations and to Malta. Uh, he, just, he, did, he just did tables of, uh, of stars, their positions, uh, just details really, ephemera about the stars, and then some work on the solar system, the planets. Most of his work actually is in the uh, Royal Institution or in the, uh, one of the libraries in Penzance. They have a lot of work there that, that done by John, John Davy. So it was about uh, two years ago, I thought I'd go in and have a look. Because when I got there, the place was all closed because they're actually removing some stuff, putting them in another room, redecorating this, reopening in about two weeks time. I went back about six months later, they hadn't done anything, it's still going on. So if anyone is down in Southwest Cornwall, if, we, if we're ever allowed to go down there, uh, call into Pensant's uh, library and uh, they've got all the stuff moved up to there now. So that's the Cornish astronomer for this time, John Davy, 
born in Penzance, younger brother of Sir Humphrey Davy. Mm. Okay. Anyone, any questions? Mm. He, he didn't become a, pro, uh, a proper professional astronomer. He was, you could call him really a big amateur astronomer, I suppose, really. But he did a lot of work. There's a lot of work in those uh, documents hidden away in the library, which one day we might be able to see. But there's a, quite a lot in the Royal Institution in London. They have a lot of his uh, work as well. A lot of his booklets, tables, masses of them, apparently. I didn't know much about that until a few days ago. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Very interesting. Yep, very interesting. Okay. Yep. Everyone, knows, oh, everyone knows about Humphrey Davy, but not about John Davy. No, because I didn't know, I'd never heard of John Davy. You've always well, you heard of Humphrey Davy. Yeah, well, because... you've, heard, you've heard of him now. Aye, yes. because my uncle, my late uncle, was a miner. You know, yeah. um, so he always mentioned the, the he, he talked about the history, the mining and that, about the, yeah. the Davy lamp and that, you know, so. One of the gases he worked on was phosgene. Um, he didn't, he didn't discover phosgene, but a lot of people actually blame him for distributing phosgene to the army. I'm not sure about this story, because phosgene, I believe, is one of the main gases used in warfare. Gas ah, right, right. They put, they put a lot of them blame on John Davy for actually for, I wouldn't say inventing it, but perhaps discovered it, I don't know. So that's one thing that's against him. Uh, he, he, in favour of him is his astronomical work on observations of the stars the multi, multi, um, in Malta and the West Indies. But what's against him is actually his work on phosgene. He, right. he, did, he did chemical work, the same as his brother. I reckon his brother probably did something about it. Do you know, right. which, is the, do you know which is the most poisonous gas in the world? When, when I was reading about this a few days ago, uh, it's actually nitrogen. If you, if you actually got pure nitrogen, you wouldn't last for long. Ah, right. Yes. But you die in ecstasy. <laughs> Did you not see the documentary years back with Michael Partello? No. And the, the, uh, he went over to Sweden to the Air Force uh, training chamber where they, they depressurized them and then fed them pure nitrogen. And you get an, a nitrogen narcosis, you know, raptures of the deep, as they used to call it. And they had to stop the experiment because. Uh, he was so away with it and enjoying it so much that he would have died in a minute more. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. Well, that's what it said on Wikipedia. That, uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen's the best gas if you want to do it because it's, uh, it's uh, natural in air along with oxygen. So the body doesn't tend to uh, go against it. If you feed mm. uh, helium, which they sometimes do to kill animals, then the bodies can react against it because helium's not a natural gas to the human body. All right, Key. Right then, okay, thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eddie. Yes, that, thank you, Eddie. That, that talk you've got next time by, was it Williamson? I, Pete um, Williamson. Pete, yeah, I just heard it actually on, uh, he did it on, um, I can't remember if it was the, the Bristol site <coughs> or, the, or the Cotswold site a few days ago. I, I, so I might not attend that one. I, I will give an, an anniversary, but uh, I listened to his talk a few days ago for the, um, I think it was the Cotswold Astronomical Society. It was, a very, it was quite a good talk, actually. Aye, it is, aye. I heard it a long while back, you know, mm. but with my foggy brain, I forget, so it's, <laughs> so it's all like new to me again. <laughs> Okay then. Good night. Thank you again. Thank, thank you again. Right. Keep taking the pills. Yes, we will do. <laughs> right, now we're on to our main speaker of the evening, our member Roy Bryce, with his talk, The Geology of Venus. And it's quite appropriate considering there's been stuff lately in the news and on the sky at night about Venus 
and the, the fosting and the, the clouds and that and the atmosphere. So, so, I, so we'll, we'll learn quite a bit about the geology of Venus, right? So, thank you. In the second or two, and I just tried to do the share screen stuff. If somebody can tell me that it's working correctly as well, that would be helpful. <laughs> Yes. Yes, it's there. It's yeah. there. Right. I'll just mute it myself. Oh, that's it. That's better. Okay. Just make sure this thing's working. All right. Hopefully you've got a spinning Venus in front of you just now. So in the best history of physics lectures, we'll have a few big facts to start off with. So Venus's orbit's about 108 million kilometers. It's got an orbital period of 225 days. And the day on Venus lasts 243 days. So it's kind of first weird thing you see is that the day on Venus is actually longer than the year. It's got an axial tilt of only two degrees compared to Earth's 23 degrees. Venus is roughly the same size or the same diameter as the Earth. It's got 87% of its volume, 81% of its mass, 90% of the gravity of Earth, it's got an iron core, about 1,100 miles radius. However, slightly odd, Venus rotates in the opposite direction to the Earth. So Venus is a terrestrial planet, and it's sometimes called Earth's sister planet because of the similar size, mass, and proximity to the Sun, and the bulk composition. However, it is radically different from the Earth in other respects. It's got the densest atmosphere of the four rocky planets, consisting of more than 96% carbon dioxide. The atmospheric pressure in the planet's surface is 92 times that on Earth, or roughly the pressure you'd find 900 metres underwater on Earth. And as I said, it has this retrograde rotation. Unlike most other planets in the solar system, which rotate on their axis in a counterclockwise direction, Venus rotates clockwise. It also rotates very slowly, as I said, taking 243 Earth days to complete a single rotation. This is not only the slowest rotation period of any planet, but as I said, it means a single day in Venus lasts longer than a Venusian year. So if you lived on Venus, your days would be longer than your years, and the sun would rise in the west. Scientists have suggested that it started off rotating counterclockwise like all the other planets, then slowed down to be almost static before starting to spin clockwise like it does now. Some astronomers think that the Sun's strong gravitational pull on the dense atmosphere of Venus and the atmospheric tides this would create, along with the tidal pulls from the other planet, could all have combined to reverse the planet's spin. This idea of tidal torques, where the dense atmosphere on the warm, sun-draped side of the planet is pulled away from the cold side, is one of the best established explanations for Venus's retrograde rotation. An alternative explanation could be that like Earth, Venus suffered multiple collisions with other planetesimals during its formation. In Earth's case, this led to the formation of the Moon. In Venus's case, some think that the pieces came back together in such a way there were no moons but a reverse spin. You just have to choose your favourite theory. It's hoped that when the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury does its two flybys of Venus, some additional data may be gained that helps solve this enigma. Venus is on the just too hot side of the solar habitable zone. And as we'll see, this has made its atmosphere very different to Earth's. The similarity in size and density between Venus and Earth suggests they share a similar internal structure core, mantle and crust. Like that of Earth, the Venusian core is at least partially liquid, 
because the two planets have been cooling at about the same rate. The slightly smaller size of Venus means pressures are 24% lower in its deep interior than Earth. The principal difference between the two planets is the lack of evidence for plate tectonics in Venus, possibly because its crust is too strong to subduct without water to make it less viscous. This results in reduced heat loss from the planet, preventing it from cooling and providing a, a likely explanation for its lack of an internally generated magnetic field. Instead, Venus may lose its internal heat in periodic major resurfacing events, which we'll visit later. As one of the brightest objects in the sky, Venus has been a major fixture in human culture for as long as records have existed. It's been made sacred to gods in many cultures, and it's been a prime inspiration for writers and poets as the morning star and the evening star. Venus was the first planet to have its motions plotted across the sky, as early as the second millennium BC. When Galileo first observed the planet in the early 17th century, he found it showed phases like the moon, varying from crescent to gibbous to full and vice versa. When Venus is furthest from the sun in the sky, it shows a half-lit phase. When it's closest to the sun in the sky, it shows as a crescent or a full phase. This could be possible only if Venus orbited the Sun. And this was among the first observations to clearly contradict the Ptolemaic geocentric model of the solar system. So did Galileo manage to see the phases of Venus? On Earth, the solar wind is deflected by Earth's magnetic field, and our atmosphere remains relatively clear. The magnetic field is generated by the core of molten iron at the centre of our planet. To understand why Venus has a different type of atmosphere, we had to wait until spacecraft could visit and take direct measurements. In 1967, Venera 4 found Venus's magnetic field to be much weaker than that of Earth. The magnetic field is induced by an interaction between the ionosphere and the solar wind, rather than by an internal dynamo, as in the Earth's case. Venus's small induced magnetosphere provides negligible protection of the atmosphere against cosmic radiation. The lack of an intrinsic magnetic field at Venus was surprising, given that it's similar to Earth in size and was expected to also contain the dynamo at its core. One possibility is that Venus has no solid inner core, or that its core is not cooling, so that the entire liquid part of the core is at approximately the same temperature. Another possibility is that its core is already completely solidified. The state of the core is highly dependent on the concentration of sulphur, which is unknown at present. The weak magnetosphere around Venus means that the solar wind is interacting directly with its outer atmosphere. Here, ions of hydrogen and oxygen are being created by the disassociation of neutral molecules by ultraviolet radiation. The solar wind then supplies energy that gives some of these ions sufficient velocity to escape Venus's gravity field. This erosion process results in a steady loss of low mass hydrogen, helium and oxygen ions, whereas higher mass molecules such as carbon dioxide are more likely to be retained. Atmospheric erosion by the solar wind probably led to the loss of most of Venus's water during the first billion years after it formed. To enable us to see details of the atmosphere of Venus, it's necessary to take observations in the ultraviolet band. This picture was taken from the Pioneer Venus Orbiter in 1979. Venus has an extremely dense atmosphere composed of 96.5% carbon dioxide, 3.5% nitrogen, and traces of other gases, most notably sulfur dioxide. This forms clouds of sulfuric acid. The mass of the atmosphere is 93 times that of Earth, whereas the pressure at its surface is about 92 times that on Earth. As I said a wee bit earlier, a pressure equivalent to roughly a kilometre under the Earth's oceans. The surface temperature on Venus is 470 degrees centigrade. This is hot enough to melt lead, and one of the main reasons why getting a lander onto the surface is such a huge problem. Temperatures that melt lead means temperatures that melt the solder that's used to connect electronic components on the spacecraft. 
If you haven't got any connections, you get no way of sending back results. It should also be noted that the high temperature is caused by the thickness of the atmosphere, not the excess of carbon dioxide, as is often suggested in discussions of Earth's global warming. Just the wee aside here, it's Carl Sagan's PhD thesis was actually on the greenhouse effect on Venus. The clouds of Venus may be capable of producing lightning. The existence of lightning in the atmosphere of Venus has been controversial since the first suspected bursts were detected by the Soviet Venera probes. In 2006 and 7, Venus Express clearly detected Whistler mode waves, which are the signatures of lightning. Their intermittent appearance indicates a pattern associated with weather activity. According to these measurements, the lightning rate is at least half that on Earth. In 2007, Venus Express discovered that a huge double atmospheric vortex exists at the South Pole. In 2011, Venus Express also discovered that an ozone layer exists high in the atmosphere of Venus. On the 29th of January 2013, ESA scientists reported that the ionosphere of Venus streams outwards in a manner similar to the iron tail seen streaming from a comet. In December 2015, researchers working on Japan's Akatsuchu mission observed bow shapes in the atmosphere of Venus. This was considered the first direct evidence of the existence of perhaps the largest stationary gravity waves in the solar system. Aside from the very surface layers, the atmosphere is in a state of vigorous circulation. The upper layer of troposphere exhibits a phenomenon of super rotation in which the atmosphere circles the planet in just four Earth days, much faster than the planet's rotation of 243 days. The winds supporting superrotation blow at 220 miles an hour, Helmer. As we've seen, or perhaps not seen, the surface of Venus couldn't be explored from orbit using visible frequency optics. Thick and opaque, the atmosphere of Venus required a method beyond optical survey to map the surface of the planet. The resolution of conventional radar depends entirely on the size of the antenna, which is greatly restricted in space by costs, physical constraints on launch vehicles, and the complexity of manoeuvring a large apparatus to provide high revolution, resolution data. Magellan addressed this problem by using a method known as synthetic aperture, where a large antenna is imitated by transmitting the data gathered back to Earth before processing by much more powerful computers than could be sensibly located on the spacecraft. The Magellan high gain parabolic antenna emitted thousands of microwave pulses that passed through the clouds to the surface of Venus, illuminating a swathe of land. The radar system then recorded the brightness of each pulse as it reflected back off the side surfaces of rocks, cliffs, volcanoes, and other geological features as a form of backscatter. To increase the imaging resolution, Magellan recorded a series of data bursts for a particular location during multiple instances called looks. Each look slightly overlaps the previous, returning slightly different information for the same location as the spacecraft moves around its orbit. After transmitting the data back to Earth, Doppler modeling was used to make the overlap looks and combine them into a continuous high resolution image of the surface. So rather a long wee section on that, but the reason I'm saying that is we're going to be looking at what looks like photographs of the surface, but it's not, you have to remember pretty much everything we're going to be looking at is a generated computerized figure, just a representation of the data as it was interpreted. And this is the geological map of the planet created from all the data sent back from Magellan. It's rather different from the geological maps that we're used to for Earth, or at least I am, but it can be interpreted as showing that the ground shows evidence of extensive volcanism, and the sulphur in the atmosphere may indicate there have been some recent eruptions. As far as we're aware, Venus has no active plate tectonics. However, test ray are a future, future unique to Venus and are characterised as continent-sized regions of high topography. 
between one and five kilometers above the average surface height. The term comes from the Greek word for tiled. Tesserae are highly deformed, often with complex patterns of ridges. These areas were formed by the intersection of at least two structural components and are classified based on these components. Tesserae are considered to be the oldest surface features on Venus because of their extensive deformation and may reflect conditions on Venus before a global restructuring event. Some of the ridges found on tesserae and terrains, particularly for Ishtar Terra, form large mountain belts. Ishtar Terra is one of two main highland regions on the planet Venus. It's the smaller of the three so-called continents and it's located near the North Pole. It's named after the Arcadian goddess Ishtar. The size of Ishtar Terra is roughly between the areas of Australia and the continental United States. On its eastern edge lies the great mountain chain Maxwell Montes, which is 11 kilometres high compared to Mount Everest at just under nine kilometres. On one side of the mountain chain is an impact crater, 100 kilometres in diameter, filled with lava. Ishtar Terra contains the four main mountain ranges of Venus. Maxwell Montes on the eastern edge, Freya Montes in the north, Acna Montes in the west, and Danai Montes in the south. These surround the lower plain of Ishtar Terra, which is named Lakshmi Planum, after the Hindu goddess Lakshmi. Ishtar Terra also contains volcanoes named after famous women, Sacagawea, Colette, and Cleopatra. Ishtar Terra is also the site of many tesserae formed by tectonic deformation. Aphrodite Terra is named after the goddess of love, the Greek equivalent of the Roman goddess Venus. It's about the same size as Africa and much rougher than Ishtar Terra. The surface appears buckled and fractured, which again suggests large compressive forces. There's also numerous extensive lava flows. Channels across this terrain, and some have an interesting bow shape to them. Aphrodite Terra also has mountain ranges, but they're only about half the size of the mountains in Ishtar. It has two main regions, Ovda Regio in the west and Thetis Regio in the east. Ovda Regio has ridges running in two directions, suggesting that the compressive forces were acting in several directions. There's also dark regions that appear to be solidified lava flows. There's cracks where lava is welled up through the surface and flooded the surrounding terrain. Alpha Regio extends for about 1500 kilometers. It was discovered and named by Dick Goldstein in 1964. Maxwell Montes, Alpha Regio and Beta Regio are the three exceptions to the rule that the surface features on Venus should be named after famous women or goddesses. Like all Tessera regions, it sits above the surrounding terrain at an elevation of one to two kilometers and it's heavily deformed by what appears to be contractional folding. Like most tesserae units, the surrounding volcanic plains appear to have flowed around Alpha's margins and are thus younger than Alpha. An infrared map prepared by the Venus Express Orbiter shows that the rocks in the Alpha Regio Plateau are lighter in colour than the cold compared to the majority of the planet. On Earth, such light coloured rocks are usually granite and form continents. Much of the Venusian surface appears to have been shaped by volcanic activity. Venus has several times as many volcanoes as Earth. It has 167 large volcanoes that are over 100 kilometers across and 900 other volcanic structures over 20 kilometers in diameter. It's assumed that there's hundreds more smaller ones. These include large volcanic edifices, shield volcano fields, and individual calderas. Each of these structures represents a centre of extrusive magma eruption and differences in the amount of magma released, depth of the magma chamber and rates of magma replenishment all affect how they form. When compared to Earth, the number of preserved volcanic zones is staggering and this is due to the lack of erosion of Venus's strong crust since there's no equivalent to the freeze-thawing mechanism that erodes mountains on Earth. 
Volcanic centres on Venus are not distributed evenly. They tend to occur in mid to upper latitudes, where rifting and extension is common, and they signal mantle upwellings to the surface. Volcanic centres on Venus are characterised in two main categories based on the ability or inability to create a shallow magma reservoir. We'll come back to that a wee bit more later. Shield fields are regions 100 to 200 kilometres in diameter that contain many small, mostly shield volcanoes, each less than 20 kilometres in diameter. The only volcanic complex of this size on Earth is the Big Island in Hawaii. Such fields may have tens to hundreds of shield volcanoes. These fields form in areas where the magma replenishment rate is too low to produce a magma reservoir in the crust, resulting in several small eruptions on a regional scale. The dominance of shield type volcanoes in these regions has led to the name shield fields. These shield volcanoes are located in Alpha Regia. This is another picture of volcanoes in Alpha Regia, but these have been formed by a completely different process. The pancake dome, also known as a lava dome, is an unusual type of volcano, and this is only found on Venus. They are widely scattered and often form in groups or clusters, though with smaller numbers of pancake domes to each group than is typical for the more common shield volcanoes. They're commonly found near Corona and Tesserae, which we looked at earlier. Pancake domes are between 10 and 100 times larger than the volcanic domes we get on Earth. They have broad flat profiles similar to shield volcanoes and they're thought to form from one large slow eruption of viscous silica rich lava. They usually have a central pit or bowl like feature similar to volcanic crater, but it's thought that these pits form after the eruption as the lava cools and emit gas rather than being a vent from which the lava originated. The surface of a pancake dome is covered with patterns of small cracks and faults. Single volcanoes denote a single large edifice. Volcanoes of this type include large volcanoes, great 100 kilometres in diameter, also named Mons, for example, Theomons and Matmons. Intermediate volcanoes from sort of 20 to 100 kilometres in diameter, and calderas. These single eruption centre volcanoes are sustained by a shallow magma chamber in the crust. I just got a thing saying the internet connection was unstable. Are you able to hear me okay, yeah? Somebody can let me know? Yeah, thank you. Yes, we can hear you okay. That's great, thanks Janice. Yep, okay. So, I was saying earlier that magma chambers on Venus are a bit different from Earth. On Earth you tend to get lava welling up quite low down and forming large chambers and staying there. In Venus, it tends to come up, as you can see on this diagram, level with the sort of general layer of the surface. So back to the text. On Earth, volcanoes mainly form where one plate slides underneath another. Moisture in the subducted plane thins the rock which rises to the surface and exits through volcanoes. On Venus, this can't happen since there's no floating plates and no water in the crust. On Venus, compressional forces cause the crust to move and crumple, resulting in fold mountains around the edges of the tessera. Sorry, just checking. <laughs> On Ishtar Terra, the magma chamber is replenished by magma from mantle upwelling and decompression melting, causing pooling and trapping in a reservoir. This trapping in a magma chamber allows long-term eruption and results in magma flows that may create large volcanic domes and flow deposits. The shape of the dome or magma flow field is determined by the chemistry and the viscosity of the magma. Another feature Venus Earth plains, again similar to Earth but not similar. Plains are large areas of relatively flat topography in Venus that form at varying elevations. Plains cover about 80% of the Venusian surface, and unlike those seen on other silicate planets, they're heavily faulted and fractured throughout. Structurally, these plains contain features such as wrinkle ridges, fractures, scarps, troughs, hills, and dikes. 
plains often contain visible flow patterns, indicating a source from volcanic lava flows. The presence of surface flow patterns in conjunction with cross-cutting valleys has given rise to the hypothesis that these plains probably formed by global lava flows over a short timescale and were subsequently exposed to compressional and extensional stresses. This is a radar mosaic from Magellan showing a 600 mile long segment of the Baltus Vallis, a channel on Venus that's longer than the Nile. The surface of Venus contains over 200 channel systems, named valves, that resemble terrestrial rivers. These channels can go up to 7,000 kilometres long and up to 30 kilometres wide. Their global distribution isn't uniform and they tend to concentrate around the equatorial region near volcanic structures. They also show characteristics of flows, such as levees on the margins and downstream narrowing and shallowing. Channels also don't contain tributaries, despite the large scale. However, because of the high surface temperature of Venus, making a comparison with terrestrial rivers is difficult. These features are similar to lava flows and other terrestrial planets, which has led to the conclusion these valets probably were formed as volcanic flows. This is also suggested by the evidence of cooled lava flows filling the valleys. Channels likely formed in very short time scales of 1 to 100 years, indicating very fast movement and erosion of lavas. There's three types of valve. Simple channels, so I just need to give me drink. Simple channels are single channel valleys <coughs> with little or no branching. Types of simple channels observed on Venus include sinuous rills, simple channels with flow margins, and canali. Sinuous rills are like those seen on the moon, narrow erosive channels that originate from regions of volcanic collapse. Simple channels with flow margin are located in obvious flow fields with an undefined source and end, and are believed to fuel, feed into large flows with surrounding volcanic features. Canali, like the Baltus Phallus, are long flows with constant width and depth that may contain abandoned channels, bends and levees, indicating their source from large amounts of thick lavas. Complex channels are channels that can be braided or in distributed patterns. They commonly form on lava flow deposits and their individual channels are separated by islands of crust. Compound channels show simple and complex channel structures. These channels usually begin as simple channels and fork and meander as flow energy decreases. This image here is the channel left by lava flowing from Fortuna Tessera to Sedna Plantinia. These photographs obviously weren't taken on Venus, but have you seen lava flows in Venus are often much larger than Earth's, up to several hundred kilometers long, and tens of kilometres wide. It's still unknown why these lava fields or low rate flows reach such sizes, but it's suggested that they are the results of very large eruptions of basaltic, low viscosity lava spreading out to form wide, flat plains. On Earth, there's two main types of basaltic lava, Aa and Pahoahoe. Aa lava presents a rough texture in the shape of broken blocks or clinkers. Pahoehoe lava is recognised by its pillowy or ropey appearance. Rough surfaces appear bright in radar images, which can be used to determine the difference between Aa. Uh, uh, oops, sorry, somebody wants in, just gonna let them in. They, yeah. Rough surfaces appear bright in radar images, which can be used to determine the differences between Aa uh, uh, and Pahoehoe lavas. These variations can also reflect differences in lava age and preservation. Channels and lava tubes are very common in Venus. This may be explained by the very fluid lava flows together with the high temperatures in Venus, allowing the lava to cool slowly. I had this problem last time I let somebody in, I have to just do something else to change the... And then I can get back on my clicker. 
Another interesting unique feature on Venus's surface are novae, which are radial networks of dikes or grabbins. The nova is formed when large quantities of magma are extruded onto the surface to form radiating ridges and trenches, which are highly reflective to radar. These dikes form a symmetrical network around the central point where the lava emerged, where there might also be a depression caused by the collapse of the magma chamber. Arachnoids are so named because they resemble a spider's web, featuring several concentric ovals surrounded by a complex network of radial fractures similar to those of a nova. It's not known whether the 250 or so features identified as arachnoids actually share a common origin, or perhaps they are the result of different geological processes. To create such lava flows requires huge volcanoes, and this is the image of the 175 kilometre wide Isabella crater, surrounded by lava flows. Located on Ishtar Terra, the more northern of the planet's two major highlands, Maxwell Montes is 11 kilometres high. It rises about 6.4 kilometres above and to the east of the Lactary Plenum, and it's about 853 kilometres long by 700 kilometres wide. The western slopes are very steep, whereas the eastern slopes descend gradually into Fortuna Tessera. Due to its elevation, it's the coolest, it's only about 380 degrees centigrade, very cool for Venus, and the least pressurised location on the surface. The origin of the Lakashmi Planum and the mountain belt such as Maxwell Montes is controversial. One theory suggests they formed over a hot plume of material rising from the interior of the planet, while another says that the region is being compressed from all sides, resulting in material descending into the interior of the planet. The broad ridges and valleys making up Maxwell Montes and Fortuna Tessera suggest that the topography resulted from compression. The parallel ridges and valleys were cut by later extensional faults. The extreme height of Maxwell Montes in relation to other compressional mountain ranges around Lactrum Planum suggests that its origin is more complex. So if we look on the right hand side of this, it looks like snow on the side of Mount Everest or somewhere like that. Most of Maxwell Montes has a bright radar return, which is common in Venus at high altitudes. Venus snow is a brightening of the radar reflection from the surface of Venus at high elevations. The nature of the snow was initially unknown. In radar images, smooth surfaces such as lava plains generally appear dark, or rough surfaces such as impact debris appear bright. The composition of the rock also alters the radar return, making conductive material appear brighter. It was therefore initially difficult to determine whether the high altitude areas of Venus were different from the lowlands in chemical composition or in texture. Possible explanations included loose soil, different rates of weathering at high and low elevations, chemical deposition at high elevation. It couldn't be water ice because there isn't any water on the extremely hot dry conditions of Venus. Data from the radar mapper in the Pioneer Venus Orbiter suggested an explanation in terms of chemical composition. It was suggested that the underlying rock contained iron pyrites or other metallic conclusions that would be very reflective. At the high temperatures found on the surface of Venus, these minerals would gradually evaporate. Faster weathering at high elevation might continually expose new material, causing the highlands to appear brighter than the lowlands. High resolution radar observations by the Magellan probe began to favour the idea that metallic compounds sublimate in lower or warmer altitudes and then deposit in the higher, cooler areas. Candidates of the metallic compounds included tellurium, pyrites, and other metal sulfides. Saxpatera is an unusual feature on Venus. Defined as a sag caldera, Sax is an elliptical depression 130 metres deep, spanning 40 kilometres in width along its longest axis. The morphology implies that a chamber of molten material drained and collapsed, forming a depression surrounded by concentric scarps 
spaced two to five kilometers apart. The arch-shaped sets of scarps extending out to the north from the prominent lips is evidence for a separate episode of withdrawal. The small lobe shapes extension to the southwest may represent an additional event. Solidified lava flows 10 to 25 kilometers long give the caldera its flower-like appearance. The flows are a lighter tone of grey in the radar data because the lava is blockier in texture and consequently returns more radar waves. Much of the lava evacuated from the chamber probably travelled to other locations underground, while some of it may have surfaced further south. This is unlike calderas in Earth, where a rim of lava builds up in the immediate vicinity of the caldera. This figure shows the volcanic peak Idnan Mons in the Indra Regio area of Venus. The volcano has a diameter of about 200 kilometres. The topographic backbone derives from data obtained from NASA's Magellan spacecraft, with a vertical exaggeration of 30 times. Radar data in brown from Magellan has been draped on top of the topographic data. Bright areas are rough or have steep slopes. Dark areas are smooth. The coloured overlay shows the heat patterns derived from surface brightness data collected by the visible and infrared thermal imaging spectrometer aboard the European Space Agency's Venus Express spacecraft. Temperature variations due to topography have been removed. The brightness signals the composition of the minerals that have been changed due to lava flow. Red-orange is the warmest area, purple is the coolest. The warmest area is centred on the summit, which stands about two and a half kilometres above the plains and the bright flows that originate there. So the reason they think this is evidence of an active volcano is obviously that the centre of the planet the, is still hotter even than the, the atmosphere. So what you're finding is the higher something up is in Venus, the cooler it tends to be as we saw earlier. And yet in this case, the hottest, the reddest bit is at the top of the structure so that has to indicate something hot has come out of it, hence a possible active volcano. Impact craters are roughly circular shaped depressions on the surface of the planet due to high velocity impacts with extraterrestrial bodies. The surface of Venus contains almost a thousand impact craters. However, unlike some planets in our system, Venus's thick atmosphere creates a strong shield that decelerates, flattens, and can even fracture incoming projectiles. The Venusian surface is devoid of small craters from 30 to 50 kilometers in size, still pretty huge by our standards, because of the effect the atmosphere has on the small bodies coming in. Depending on the angle of impact, velocity, size, and strength of the approaching body, the atmosphere may tear and crush the projectile, essentially melting it in the air. This is a complication when studying the surface of Venus, since in planetary science, impact craters are used to determine relative ages and to approximate absolute ages of surface features. Craters on Venus are kept in pristine condition, thus making their classification and impact mechanics easy to interpret. As I said, small projectiles burn up in the atmosphere and those that do make it to the surface break into smaller pieces creating clusters of impact craters, similar in appearance to circular lunar craters. As crater size increases, the chance of breakup in the atmosphere decreases, and the impact craters become more circular, with central peaks from isostatic rebound of the crust. The atmosphere can flatten and show larger meteorites to terminal velocity, and cause them to explode on impact or near the surface, showering the region in debris. The shock waves from these explosions can flatten the surrounding area for several kilometres. Large impacts create parabolic excavation cones and flows of lava like debris. New crust on Earth gets built horizontally, thanks to the lateral motion of the spreading centres. Without such spreading, new crust on Venus has to be built vertically. On Venus, the crust gets thickened by the top of volcanism 
and on the bottom by slowly cooling magma reservoirs. This process builds a thick and correspondingly strong resultant crust that grows thicker over time. Such a strong crust resists deformation, even if Venus's mantle flows and circulates under the crust like Earth does. Without deformation, plate tectonics can't start. Plate tectonics plays a crucial role in Earth's geology. The churning of the solid rocky mantle with hot material rising from deep in the interior and causing volcanic eruptions at the surface efficiently moves heat from deep within the Earth out of the planet and out into space. On Venus, without plate tectonics, heat has no quick route out of the interior. The planet generates interior heat in the same way that Earth does, by freezing of the core and radioactive decay. On Venus, the heat has nowhere to go. It builds up and the mantle starts to melt. If there continues to be no heat release, it's possible for large sections of the mantle to melt relatively quickly generating a massive reservoir of magma at the crust mantle boundary, and then this erupts. Many more specific mechanisms have been posed to produce global volcanic catastrophe, but each one of them has the same basic idea in common, massive all-encompassing destabilization of Venusian mantle, producing a correspondingly massive response, and the release of all that magma as volcanism to return things thermally to business as usual. When this happens, Venus returns to being a slowly cooling, mostly stagnant planet. It's possible that it might already have cooled to the point where such resurfacing events may never happen again. Again, you probably guess this isn't on Venus. Water is almost non-existent on Venus, and thus the only erosive process to be found is the interaction produced by the atmosphere with the surface. This interaction is present in the injector of impact craters expelled onto the surface of Venus. The material ejected during a meteorite strike is lifted to the upper atmosphere, where winds transport the material towards the west. As the material is deposited on the surface, it forms parabola-shaped patterns. This type of deposit can be established on top of various geological features or lava flows. Therefore, these deposits are the youngest structures on the planet. Images from Magellan reveal the existence of more than 60 of these parabola-shaped deposits that are associated with crater impacts. Unfortunately, despite over an hour of trying, I couldn't find a picture of any of those parabola-shaped deposits. The ejection material, transported by the wind, is responsible for the process of renovation of the surface at speeds of about a metre a second. Given the density of the lower Venusian atmosphere, the winds are more than sufficient to erode the surface and transport fine grain material. In the regions covered by ejection deposits, there are wind lines, dunes and yardings. The wind lines are formed when the wind blows ejection material and volcanic ash, depositing it on top of topographical obstacles such as domes. As a consequence, the leeward side of zones is exposed to the impact of small grains that remove the surface cap. Such processes expose the material beneath, which has a different roughness, and thus different characteristics under radar compared to the formed sediment. The dunes are formed by the deposit of particulates that are the size of grains of sand and have wavy shapes. Yardangs, like the picture of this one on Earth, are formed when the wind transported material carves the fragile deposits and produces deep furrows. Recent Magellan images show over 6,000 wind-formed landforms, including dunes, wind streaks and yardings. Dunes and yardings have direct analogues on Earth, and the process that creates them here can be applied to those seen on Venus. Large dune fields have been identified at the surface, and the dunes range in size from metres to hundreds of metres. Similarly, yardang fields may exist in locations such as Mead Crater. Wind streaks are parallel linear streaks that form as prevailing winds eroding the surface geology. These features illustrate the erosive effects the atmosphere has on the surface of Venus. NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and others have suggested that Venus may have had a shallow ocean in the past for up to two billion years with as much water as Earth. 
<coughs> depending on the parameters used in their theoretical model, the last liquid water could have evaporated as recently as 700 million years ago. Currently, the only known water on Venus is in the form of a tiny amount of atmospheric vapour, about 20 parts per million. Hydrogen is still being lost to space in modern times, as detected by ESA's Venus Express spacecraft. We're expending a lot of time and effort sending missions to Mars to try to discover traces of ancient life forms there. So is it possible that early forms of life could also have survived somewhere on Venus? In September 1967, Carl Sagan suggested that life could have survived in the cloud tops of Venus, where the temperature ranges from 65 to minus 20 degrees centigrade. As I'm sure you're aware, and as we talked about before we started tonight, research published in September 2020 indicated the detection of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. As far as we're presently aware, this gas cannot be produced in Venus's atmosphere by anything other than biological processes. It's also not expected that a molecule like phosphine can persist in the Venusian atmosphere for more than a few weeks since the ultraviolet radiation would cause it to react with water and carbon dioxide and break the molecules apart. This suggests that there is some process that is causing it to be continuously produced. Phosphine is created by a, in anaerobic ecosystems on Earth, and it's therefore consider, considered as a possible biomarker. The discovery of phosphine also gives a potential explanation to the dark streaks on the surface of Venus detected by the Japanese Space Agency, which could be colonies of microbes living in the cloud layer. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary levels of proof. So it's worth noting that Professor Jane Greaves and her colleagues followed the highest levels of scientific practice by first looking for and detecting phosphine using the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii and analysing the results with one type of mathematical analysis. She then convinced a completely separate team at the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile to perform the same search, but using their own independent analysis of the results. Both methods indicated the presence of phosphine. So in science, this is good enough evidence to publish. However, the detection of phosphine will not be considered factual until other, other teams of scientists using their own methodologies also confirmed both the presence of the gas and the lack of any other geological process that could create it on Venus. So we might have to wait a while for any definitive proof of simple life forms being created anywhere except on Earth. It would take a long time for NASA or any of the other national space agencies to approve and send a spacecraft to the planet with a specific task of detecting the source of phosphine. However, as luck would have it, Rocket Lab, a private small rocket company founded in New Zealand, has been working on just such a mission. The company has already developed a small satellite called Photon that it planned to launch on its own electron rocket as soon as 2023. Peter Beck, Rocket Lab's founder and chief executive, said, This mission is to go and see if we can find life. Obviously, this discovery of phosphine really adds strength to that possibility. So I think we need to go there and have a look. Usually when I talk about geology, it's with regard to processes that continue for millions of years. So it came as a bit of a shock to me to discuss such a major difference in the way we think about the possibility of life on Venus had changed completely in the last two weeks. Not many pretty pictures in this presentation, I'm afraid to say, but hopefully I've helped you to understand that Venus is more than just a fuzzy ball of light in the sky. As you know, I'm not an expert, but if you've got any questions, I'll try and do my best to invent an answer. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I say something? Yeah, please do, Eddie. Many moments ago, I was looking at all these pictures of Venus, and there are a lot of false colour in them. Uh -huh. I think the fir first one showed uh, traffic light colours, reds, there was reds, there was blues, there was greens on Venus. Yeah. 
And a lot of them have come since, shown shades of yellow. And I did try and inquire, I think it was the astronomers at uh, Bristol University, I tried to find out what, what would Venus have looked like umpteen million years ago during its active stage without the clouds? What colour would, would, would you have seen? And they came up with some ideas and I actually made a globe of Venus, oh. trying to put in what it, what, what it would have looked like to an observer from Earth oh, with right. quite a great big telescope looking at Venus during its active stage. I don't know if this will show up on the screen. Uh, oh yes, that's this, nice. This, this is a globe I made. Um, well, I think it's not very really clear, is it? Oh, it's good. I can see oh, it. That's good. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, that's can marvelous. Um, yeah, it's good. Good. That's brilliant. It's not, not showing up too well. Wow. Uh, perhaps if I move my uh, iPad that's around. That's brilliant. Um, that's brilliant, that. Yeah. Let's see if I can stand up a minute. What can you see now? Where's it gone? Uh, Disappeared. Uh, Disappeared, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I saw it better. No, let's try, try something else. <laughs> it needs to be a long way further away, I think. Oh, we can see a wee bit of it now. Aye. Mm. Well, that's brilliant. Yeah. It, it, would, it would have been browns. Yeah. The red is the up is the erupting volcanoes. It's actually a three D. It's actually oh. it's a, it's a, lot of, a lot of thick, gluey stuff I put there, so it, it is actually 3D. Uh -huh. you, you would have seen, seen sh shades of red, brown, grey, uh, where all the lava is cooled in. The lava would have been dark grey, probably, or, or blackish. Uh -huh. right. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Hi. Uh -huh. I love it. Yeah. Hi. That's, 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 good. that's really good, that. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you some photographs. Would that be better? Yes, yes, yeah. that'd be great, Eddie. Thanks. Yeah, that's really good. That I mean, very impressed. <laughs> up towards the north wow. pole. Yeah. I, I mean, considering yeah. I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler, I mean that. Well, that is brilliant. That really good. Yeah. I'll send them three or four photographs. If, I don't know if you can right. send it out to the members. It's amazing. Love it. Yeah. It's great. Brilliant. Huh? Yeah. That's more what it looked like without your false colour. Oh, that is that. Well done. Aye. Well done. A lot of the red would have been erupting. The yellowy colours would have been sulphur mm. coming out of the volcanoes. Mm -hmm. A lot of the lava here. Is a, uh, a lot of lava. A lot of lava. Well, I'd be yeah. laughing a bit better if I send you some photographs. Yes. I don't oh, know if you really good. Don't know if you can send them out to members. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Well, that's really good. It was an old Earth globe that I painted over years ago. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> You got to um, Pete Williamson in is it two or three weeks' time. I the fifth of October, so two oh, weeks' time. So, right. Um, I, I will do an anniversary on, on another um, Cornish astronomer. But at the beginning of Pete's talk, it might have been his first, second, or third slideshow slide he put up. I noticed a mistake with a date, and I pointed, right. I pointed it out to him at the end. And he said, "Oh, I'm playing that on Wikipedia." <laughs> so, so if if you see this, if you watch this uh, his talk, which is excellent, just notice at the beginning, first, second, or third slide, he's put up on the screen an incorrect date which he didn't know. So perhaps some of you can point it out to him at the end. <laughs> <laughs> look out! Look out for that date right at the beginning. Right. Okay. Okay then. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm Thank going. I'm going now to get on the phone to one of my daughters. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All the best, everyone. Yes. You too. All Thank best. you too. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye, Eddie. Bye. <laughs>
Any more questions for Roy? Um, just, just one. Where you were showing the wind effects on rocks, those of course would be um, artists' impressions that they taken from the radar reflection. Which one, sorry, the, well, the yard I was showing earlier. Sorry? The colour for when you're talking about the wind erosion. Yeah, the, the wind erosion, you showed a colour slide showing the sort of rock formation with the wind erosion. Ah, yeah, that's yeah. in the desert of Amman. Is that an, an artist's impression? It's not a... a no, truth. no, that's, that's actually a rock in the desert in Amman. Okay. A thing called the Yardang. <laughs> So yeah. obviously we don't have any close-ups of the surface of Venus. Oh, well, I knew so that. I was just yeah. trying to show you something that showed erosion patterns on a rock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the problems. With, again, uh, I originally did this talk about two years ago. Uh, I think it was actually at the AGM for Clydesdale. And it was just a quick half-hour presentation. So when I was going to do the longer version for tonight, I spent quite a lot of time searching through trying to get the best high definition images I could, but also a, a bigger variety of images. And uh, there's actually very few, to be honest, if you've ever looked through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that, you know, I'm going you know, to be on screen for a minute or two while I talk because there just aren't any examples of actual uh, surface features to be seen. I still think it's fantastic, but from the radar reflections and images they get from that, that they're able to deduce so much yes. about the internal structure yeah. of the planet. I think, again, that's one of the big problems. Because the surface temperature is so hot, hot, it's going to be incredibly difficult to figure out if it's still got a liquid core or you know whether there has been any tectonics or anything like that, because the surface temperature at its height, you know, just masks almost anything that's happening underneath the surface. Tricky. <laughs> but no doubt somebody will come up with a very clever way and figure out how to do it in the same way they did with the side scan radar. I can oh, I know, sorry, I know when, when I was making up my talk about volcanoes in the solar system, try to find, look what you're saying, decent images, the wow factor images, you know, for Venus, it, was, it took hours to try and find these images. You know? Yeah. Did, the, um, mm. did you see any geology from the photographs that Venera probes took? I, I'm not sure, Jim, to be honest. I don't know. I think I showed a couple of the early slides were Venera, but I, I, I couldn't be specific about anything. I think <coughs> the continents, but I was about to, just the major features. Roy, you you were talking about the surface temperature of Venus being whatever, 400 and what have you? Uh, is, is that the daytime temperature? Well, maximum. And if so, what 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 does the nighttime temperature drop to? Well, you don't really. Seeing get as it's such a long day. Yeah, well, it's not so much that because the atmosphere is so thick, and mm -hmm. because a day is longer than a year, uh -huh. you don't really get one side of the planet heating and the other side cooling. The, mm -hmm. There's a constant high wind that rotates the heat and mixes the heat all around it. So I think mm -hmm. it's pretty much the same temperature all the way around all the time. Mm -hmm. It's my yeah. man assisted oven. Yeah. Aye, because yeah. it's a runaway greenhouse. Yeah. Well, a runaway it's greenhouse like system. Yeah, it's only a runaway yes. greenhouse to the extent I tried to explain earlier that yeah. there's carbon dioxide being left behind. But it's yeah. not carbon dioxide that makes it hot. It's the pressure yeah. that makes it hot. Aye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, I get slightly annoyed sometimes on the telly when they keep going on, oh, if we don't do something about global warming, it'll be like Venus. No, it won't. Yeah. There's a lot of things global warming's going to do, but it won't make the planet like Venus. Do we have any idea how it will progress over the next few million, billion years? I mean, obviously it'll be vaporised eventually by an expanding sun, but 
that's a long time hence. So what's what's its its prognosis? Will it just carry on getting hotter or what? Uh, well, again, I'm not too sure on that one because one of the things that was mentioned was that <laughs> it was suggested that the core <laughs> might have already gone solid, uh -huh. in which case there's going to be less heat coming from inside. Mm -hmm. So if anything, it might start to cool rather than keep getting hotter. Haven't they discovered some volcanoes that are still active? Didn't I read that? Well, recently? I showed that. That was one of the slides I showed. Yeah. Oh. Where the top of the volcano is in red. Yeah. Is, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so again, there's the difference between the core of the planet and magma mm -hmm. chambers up nearer the surface. Right. So okay. If the core had already frozen, that wouldn't mm -hmm. stop magma being available still at the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, so it's not me because I don't know enough about it, but one of the suggestions was that the major resurfacing events, they, there may not yeah. be any more of them because, you know, the planet's already cooled to the extent it couldn't happen again. But because yeah. the surface temperature is so high, it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to have anything other than just theories and something like that. We just don't know. Right. Yeah, have have we got any idea of the sort of chemistry of Venus, uh, such that we can make some idea of the min or get some idea of the mineralogy of the rocks and magma that are moving about there? Again, I certainly haven't seen anything about. It. I think yeah, because all okay. you do, I mean, they have, or again, one of the slides mentioned things like they reckon the snow in Venus is these tellurium or iron pyrites that's evaporated mm -hmm. so but again what they're really just doing is guess a metal with a fairly low melting point <laughs> <laughs> if it was at a slightly lower temperature would they go back to being a solid again and therefore give you the venus right. snow but i think it's you know it's all very theoretical as my mm -hmm. understanding yeah, I, of what they're yeah. saying I like theoretical guesswork sort of thing, but theory nonetheless, yeah. <laughs> or a hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. To know what the, the surface would be, you need to see a spectrum, but you can't see directly the light from the surface, so you can't ever see a spectrum. Exactly. Could I ask a question, please? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Hugh Somerville from the ASE. Um, first of all, on behalf of the other members, I see there's about half a dozen of us are watching. It's a fantastic talk, absolutely fascinating. Um, I was wondering uh, if the Soviets um, did anything in the way of protecting the Venera uh, craft, or did they just was it just uh, wish it good luck and hope it survived for a few seconds or minutes? No, I think it was the opposite. I think they tried, well, they did design <laughs> it to be a complete tank. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> even a complete tank doesn't stand a chance on the surface of Venus. You know, it is so hostile, there, so incredibly hostile. And as I, again, I, I did mention, but I don't know if you picked up on, the temperature there is so hot that solder melts and all the electronic components are held together by solder. Yep. So if the electron it melts, never yeah. mind solder. <laughs> four hundred and seventy or something, isn't it centigrade? Yeah, well, it's four hundred and eighty, I think, on the surface. Oh, of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know, whereas a match can melt solder, it's a much problem. So it's just it's astonishingly difficult to be there. But what they have talked about doing, and I think there's certainly plans afoot in NASA, is you actually send a balloon. So there's no attempt to get on the surface. I mean, don't be silly, don't even try and do it. But they reckon a balloon could float around up there for years. Again, the right. atmosphere is so dense. You know, when I'm talking about a balloon, you're probably talking something that looks, you know, like a great big ball. That probably looks more like, you know, the sort of thing you put down at the bottom of the ocean. But, you know, just a good strong metal ball will float quite happily. You know, sort of 20 or 30 miles up in the wind, as we said earlier, it travels about 200 miles an hour. So you've got a free way of getting something to travel around the entire planet. So I'm pretty sure that will happen. 
do, do we have any indication of the um, of the temperature at the visible cloud level that we see to get an idea of the temperature gradient going down? I was wondering if the if, if the gas near the surface might actually be hotter than the actual surface itself. You know, with the winds yeah. taking the atmosphere around. I don't know anything on that, my friend. Sorry, we don't we don't know. Well, I don't know, but I haven't know seen the anything about of the, that while I was the looking for surface of the clouds. Yeah. Did that Russian uh, did that Russian spacecraft measure temperatures it went in? I don't know. I said, uh, I, don't know. I didn't check that one out. I don't know. Yeah. No idea either. I saw a report about uh, the phosphine that was um, found recently, and it suggested that, quote, I'll, I'll just quote, that the temperature at which the phosphine was uh, found was what they called shirt sleeve temperature. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> so I presume that's sort of 20, 30, 40, something that we could live with. Yeah. And that's 50 or 60 miles up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd expect a big temperature gradient down through a dense yeah. cloud like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? Because mm. I can never think you one. <laughs> <laughs> So I could never think of the answer anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like us to thank Roy in the usual way for his excellent presentation. It was very interesting, you know, and I've taken note of some of the crater names and that, just in case I update my volcano and the solar system talk anytime. Right, so very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy. Yeah. So, Alison, Andy, do you just want to stay on for a chit chat or so? Aye, aye, that's fine, aye. I'll need I to don't... Go, I need to disappear to the loo, so chat amongst yourselves. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is Robert still there? Um, yeah, yeah. Have you, <clears throat> you sorted out uh, agenda well, for the AGM? Pardon? The minutes are done. Thanks very much for inviting us from Edinburgh. So All right, there. no problem. That was a really okay. good one. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. No, I'll I'll invite you again for for the next one in that as well. That'll be super. Great. Thanks right. very much. Right. Okay. Right, so if you put the the agenda, I know you're saying you've done the minutes. So so is that the agenda then for what? Aye, well, that's my brains away. <laughs> Uh, the agenda's usually just half a dozen items, uh, and it's sort of always the same format, you know. Aye. Unless you get additional questions, or additional yeah. questions. Right. So, I mean, if you send me the minutes and the, and the thing, and then I can... I I'm can stick in, a, in another room, mm. I'll go get it and put it in this computer. Aye. And that oh. way, that way, either yourself can, can attach it, to, to an email for the members, or I can mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll send you, you Amanda. Aye. Yeah. If you send it to the Clydesdale Astronomical Society um, email address, then I can just forward that on to to the members. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, yeah. that's lovely. Uh, Alice, well, Alice Amanda, I've over. got the... Um, uh, I, I got the audited accounts back from John Gallagher yesterday. Right. So this, I'll send this is still getting a recorded. copy of the accounts by over. The way. You can send them out at the same time. Right. So this is still getting okay. recorded, by the way. Aye, it'll be fine. Aye. This is still getting recorded. Yeah, I was thinking that. I'll just stop by the way. Hold on a second. <laughs>